speaker series without their generosity none of this would happen we're very grateful for your constant commitment to torah and to jewish life and to learning i want to thank you all for joining tonight and i want to in particular thank rachel lewinsky and rabbi fedegren for their efforts along with the uh, programming committee to make tonight and the rest of the speakers and the entire uh, calendar and program a reality i also want to give a shout out to all of you that if there are other people that you'd like to speak, hear speak or other events that you'd like to see coming May through July, we'd look forward to hearing from you because we want to bring the best of the Jewish world here uh, to the end of the Jewish world in Vancouver. So before I uh, hand it over, I just wanted to highlight that the speaker series is really a beautiful mix of incredible uh, speakers across the Jewish world, men and women. Proudly of the first seven, four of the speakers are in fact women, strong, inspirational and thoughtful women just as Charlene and as Charlene Amanoff is kicking this off. And, and her story is one that resonates with me and so many, and her passion and her Avat Israel is palpable. For me, this was so important uh, because I, I, I fundamentally believe that we as a people wouldn't have survived 2000 years of uh, diaspora living if it wasn't for strong Jewish women and mothers. Their bond, the constancy of their love and their um, constant guidance and, and showing us the, the right derech of survival and of uh, love of Torah and also of uh, Jewish peoplehood. So I'm really proud tonight to not only have Charlene here speaking, but to also welcome Becky Glotman, who's a board member and also one of the co-chairs of the Ben-Gurion Society as part of Jewish Federation of Greater Vancouver. She inspires me and so many through her passion and commitment at a uh, very, uh, I, I don't want to embarrass her, but you'll see, she's, she's not old like me. She's young and she's very committed to uh, Jewish community and uh, to, uh, to understanding how to continue to build it here in Vancouver. So without further ado, I want to, on behalf of our little shuttle, Charlene, wish you a, a, a great deal of thanks and appreciation for you joining us. And I want to hand over the microphone to uh, Becky, who will serve as the moderator and MC tonight. Becky, please. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Jonathan. As I always say, you inspire me every day. So that's amazing. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Becky Glotman, and I'm on the Charisetic Board and also the Programming Committee in 2021. Um, and tonight, on behalf of the Charisetic Programming Committee, it is my absolute pleasure this evening to introduce our amazing speaker, Charlene Amanoff. Charlene Amanoff is a dynamic speaker who travels the world captivating audiences with the story of the miraculous survival of her daughter, Gally's drowning, which led to her becoming Froom. She is a proud Hatzalah wife, mommy of five miracles, founder of Gally's Couture Wigs, modest fashion clothing designer, and may I say very fashionable as I've seen on your Instagram, Thank you. um, and teen mentor. Her Nishmat movement has recruited over 16,000 women globally in her Nishmat army who recite Nishmat Kol Hai daily, which has inspired the new Nishmat book by Art Scroll. Charlene uses her large, powerful, and influential social media platforms to spread Emuna, spread light, and help bring others close to Hashem. I'm sure many of you will have questions throughout tonight's talk. So please write them in the chat box and we will make sure to get through them at the end of Charlene's talk. And with that, I hand to you, Charlene. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for having me this evening. And you know the saying, everybody has a story. Everybody has a story, but I don't think anybody here has a story like mine. My story takes place almost 12 years ago. It was July 26, 2010. The Hebrew date was Tu Ba'av, the 15th day of Av. The 15th day of Av happens to be a very happy day on the Jewish calendar. My family and I, Baruch Hashem, we live part of the year in Great Neck, New York, and part of the year in Miami Beach. My husband, God bless him, he's actually a legal resident. So he makes sure to keep six months and one day in Florida. And he is one day shy of six months in New York. So my story takes place in Miami Beach. I grew up in an extremely warm, spiritual, delicious, traditional Sephardi home. We had no money, but we thought we were the richest kids in the world. My mother would walk through the rooms of our broke down tiny two bedroom apartment 
in Queens with four little kids and she would walk through the rooms and say, thank you Hashem for this palace. So we, the children kept looking around thinking, this is a palace. We are in a palace, we're the richest kids in the world. It wasn't until we were all married and thank God recognizing that we're now married and living more privileged lives than that that we were used to, that we recognize that we grew up with no money, but we had everything in the world. So that type of upbringing really infused and instilled within me a tremendous love for Hashem. So although I wasn't on the outside very religious per se, my insides were so connected to Hashem my whole life. July 26, 2010 is seemingly the day that Hashem decided to bridge the gap between my insides and my outsides. That was the day that Hashem decided that I would catch up to all the mitzvot on the outside as I had already been loving and keeping on the inside. My husband, Jonathan, is an extraordinary man. In fact, I'm a little uncomfortable to take this covered of speaker, speaker about my story because I somehow just became the face of the story. It's really in Jonathan's credit that I'm here. My husband, Jonathan, has been a volunteer paramedic for 30 years. He's now Great Neck Coordinator for Hatzalah. He retired at the age of 40 from the hedge funds. And Baruch Hashem, he's just, we've dedicated our lives to spreading light because at the end of the day, that, that's what really, that's what the world needs right now. And exactly 12 years ago, this coming July, was the day that our life changed forever. We were vacationing in Miami Beach and I had my four children at the time. Thank God, now I'm blessed with five. But at the time of my story, I had Jacob who was six, Zachary who was four, Gali, which is actually the nickname, her real name is Avigail Khanna. Gali had just turned two and my baby Eliza was only three weeks old when we moved down to Miami for the whole summer. I was so excited and so ecstatic to be in Miami for the duration of the summer. At the same time, I was so grateful to Hashem for all of my blessings. What I mean by that is I struggled with infertility for many years. I had 11 miscarriages and I was told that I would never have children. But by the grace of Hashem and by a lot of soul searching and taking upon myself personal mitzvot to bring myself closer to Hashem, I was blessed with five delicious kids in seven years. So I went a few years with no kids and then Hashem said, here, take it, take it. and one more, one more. And Baruch Hashem, now I have my amazing, delicious family. So my story is about my daughter, Gali. She's, she's my two-year-old at the time. We're in Miami Beach. And at the time, my husband was still trading in the stock market, but it was Tuba Av. And we know that it's a very special day on the Jewish calendar. So my husband said to me, why don't we do something fun to just give the kids a little extra boost because it's such a special day. So I said, amazing. And it was also very convenient that we had flown down my parents to spend Shabbat with us that week because being away from the parents for so long over the course of the summer takes its toll on them. So we like to bring one set of parents one week, my in-laws the other week, and it's amazing. Baruch Hashem. It works out well. Before you applaud me and think I'm the best daughter-in-law or daughter in the world, I should let you know that the truth is a little bit ulterior motive. It's free babysitting, free cooking, free cleaning, all hands on deck. It just works for everybody. But that week happened to be the week that my parents had joined us for a long weekend. My husband decided that we're going to go boating and we're going to go wave running with my older, bo with my older boys, my six-year-old and my four-year-old. But we're not going to just abandon the kids, the girls, of course. So Gali, my two-year-old, fell asleep on a lounge chair by the pool. We live in the Green Diamond in Miami Beach, for those of you who are familiar. And at the time, my housekeeper said to me, Gali just fell asleep. Don't wake her up. Let her stay here with me. You go with your husband, take Jacob and Zachary. And at the same time, my baby Eliza was indoors with my mom. Remember, July 26th in the summer in Miami, it's scorching hot. So I wasn't going to bring my infant out. And Gali falling asleep was perfect timing. I said, you know what? This might be the most perfect opportunity to rekindle the bond with the boys. The past few weeks, all they're seeing is two really cute girls. 
level the playing field. And now the girls have invaded their turf. Time to bring it back to the boys. The crazy thing was that that morning, my husband stood by my balcony overlooking the water and he pulled open the drapes and he said to me, honey, you have to come and see this. You have to come and see the sky. And I was exhausted because I had my infant over here. I had my toddler over here. I had my four-year-old over here and I had my six-year-old clinging to my leg. And I said, I'm, honey, I'm so tired. I can't get up. He said, what? just get one, one minute, get out of bed and come look at the sky. And I thought for my husband to alert me to something beautiful in the sky, something is really strange. So I dragged my tired body out of my bed and I walked over to the balcony and I see the most magnificent cobalt blue sky I've ever seen. Now, one can argue that Miami skies are always glorious, but this was something very different. There was not a cloud in the sky. It was a shade of blue that I'd never seen and I have not seen since then. And I looked out and I said, life is perfect. Life is perfect. Here I am. I wasn't meant to have any children. I was told by the top infertility specialists to give up in my quest to become a biological mother. And here I am proving science and medicine wrong. I had four of my own children. I was overwhelmed. And at the same time, I felt a little guilty. You see, although my insides were on a very high level, of serving Hashem. I was very connected. I was very spiritual. I was saying to Hill around the clock. I was praying. I was giving charity. We were checking mezuzahs. We were keeping the mitzvot, keeping Shabbat. On the outside, I wasn't really ready yet. And certainly my lifestyle didn't help being married to the CEO of a hedge fund and living a certain lifestyle, going out with a certain type of people. It just it didn't seem like it was conducive to the Orthodox observant Smooth, modest lifestyle. You know the saying, man plans, God laughs. So I renamed it to man plans, but God plans better. My husband drags me to the balcony. And of course I see the sky and I say, okay, let's go. What are we doing? And he said, you know what? We're going to go boating, take out the boat. Let's go wave running. Let's have a really fun day. So I said, perfect. I got ready, I got dressed, we set everything up, my parents were, were on board, and we began to go towards the beach. I left Gali asleep on the lounge chair with my housekeeper. It is an apartment complex, it's not a hotel, so it's completely deserted in the summer. And I left my housekeeper with a stack of Vogue magazines to keep her busy while Gali rested. And as we were walking towards the beach, I did feel a little guilty that Hashem had given me so much. And what, what had I given him in return? Okay, so I was wearing skirts, that's it. I was standing there in a bathing suit with my gorgeous, long, thick blonde hair out on display for the world. And I felt like I owe him more than this. I'm a smart girl. I was valedictorian. I went to college on a full scholarship. I know better. I should be doing better. But of course, you get caught up in the convenience of your life. and. You don't think to move out of your comfort zone until, until you have a very loud and scary wake up call. We finished boating and we finished wave running and we started coming back to the beach, to the pool. And my husband being a medic has what I call bionic hearing. I think every medical professional has it. And all of a sudden, as we're approaching the pool, my husband hears commotion from afar. So he looks at me and he says, sweetie, do you hear that? Someone's in trouble. So I was, I'm, my reflexes are terrible. That is why I am not in the medical field because God forbid, I don't know what would happen to my patients. I have really, really bad reflexes. So I said to him, I said, I don't hear a thing, but you're also not on call. You're not in New York, just relax. You're on vacation. But men like Jonathan don't relax. He said, no. Something is wrong. Someone's in trouble. Someone's crying for help. I need to go. So he begins to pick up the pace and he starts running towards our pool because that's where the noise, that's where the commotion sounds like it's coming from. There's a certain sense of 
bina, intuition, that I think all Jewish women possess. And I think that day mine was heightened for a reason. Because as soon as he thought he heard something, I got this really scary feeling. I got butterflies in my stomach, but not the good kind. And my husband begins to run towards the pool and I see he makes a left turn going up the ramp towards the blue and green diamond pool deck, which is where, I, where, where we live. I look at my boys and I say, guys, did daddy just go towards our pool? Or did he go towards like the Eden Rock? And my Jacob said, no, mommy, he looks like he went to our pool. That's when my anxiety started to heighten. And I picked up, I got, grabbed their hands. My father and my brother were behind us and we started to run towards the pool. We approach the pool and we see a man standing in the middle of our pool, a grown man in his 60s, very tall, with his back to us, and he's holding the dead body of a little girl, and he's screaming for help. Somebody call 911! Somebody call 911! My husband, being a, a trained professional, screams back at the man. I am 911. What, what's wrong? I can help you. Begins to turn around in slow motion. And I, before he turns around, I can already see that this adorable little child that he's holding is completely gone. Her whole body is blue. The tips of her nails, I will never, for the rest of my life, I will not forget the way her nails look. The tips of her nails are purple. Her eyes are wide open and she is a limp, ragged doll. And all of a sudden, something about her looked a little too familiar to me. So I quickly looked to see, you know, that flight, that fight or flight. I quickly looked to see where my daughter is. And I see my daughter is not there, but my housekeeper is sound asleep. I look back at this man and my hell begins to unfold when I see this man is holding, the, he's holding the dead body of my daughter. If I can describe, if I can describe Gehenna, hell, I promise you I can paint it with vivid brush strokes. This man turns around and he's holding my daughter's body and my husband begins screaming, that's my child. Golly, don't you dare leave daddy. And he grabs Golly from his arms and he lays her on the ground and he begins to perform CPR. It is a sight I wish not upon any Jew in the world. Till this day, 12 years later, every single time I close my eyes when I want to go to sleep at night, which is usually around 3 a.m., I'm haunted by that image of her blue, purple tips of her nails and my husband doing CPR on her limp body. But as Rana Hashem, please God, when the Shiach comes, I will be healed. But until then, this is what replays in my mind, like a chronic constant soundtrack. My husband grabs her and he begins performing CPR and he's screaming all these terms that the wife of a medic understands. I have a two-year-old in full cardiac arrest. She's cyanotic. I have nothing. I've got nothing. She's in cardiac arrest? No, no, Hashem, no, no. And I'm thinking to myself, no, and I'm, I'm pinching myself. I'm physically pinching myself to wake myself up from this nightmare. But I'm not waking up from this nightmare because it's my reality. And as he's doing CPR, he's screaming, I need, I need an ambulance, I need a bus, I need an ambulance, that. Why is my life? Why is my life, my life was perfect. Hashem, my life was perfect just a few hours ago. And if I have to, God forbid, bury my child, I want to be buried with her. My children did not come easy to me by any stretch of the imagination. I had to fight. I had to beg. I had to plead for each and every one of them. From my 11 miscarriages, the majority of them never made it past the 14-week mark. So I knew that these precious drools Hashem gave me were very, very rare. And right now I'm looking at one of them being returned to her creator. 
a bit of a blur that's in, a bit of a fog. But all of a sudden, the Tehillim I had been saying my whole life, and that spiritual connector, that, that line, that direct line that my mother had built from within our neshama, straight up to Hashem, suddenly came, came back to help me. This, this saying, this one pasuk, this verse from Psalms, Tehillim, begins flashing in my mind like a neon banner. Karati b'cholev aneni Hashem chukecha etzola. It's a verse from Perak 119 in Sefer Tehillim, chapter 119 in Psalms, and the verse means, Karati b'cholev, I cried out with all my heart, aneni Hashem, answer me, God. I will keep your weight. Right then and there, I actually physically looked at my body and I recognized that I'm not keeping your ways, God. I'm keeping my ways. I'm not serving you on your terms the way you deserve to be served. I'm serving you in my way, my convenient way. And right then I recognized that this was a very loud and very scary wake up call from Hashem. Without a moment's hesitation, I knew what Hashem wanted from me. He wanted my hair and my body. He wanted the external Charlene to bridge the gap and to reach the level of the internal Charlene. I looked around while my husband is continuing to perform CPR to no avail. And I see that somebody had left a blue pashmina shawl on a lounge chair. So I reached for the shawl and I raised up my right arm and I began to scream. Many of you recognize this blessing. It is a blessing we make the very first time we do something or the first time we do something in a long time. It's a very powerful blessing. I began to wrap my gorgeous hair and I'm Persian. I don't look very Persian and that my hair had been a claim to fame of mine since I was a little girl. Growing up, my nickname amongst my grandmother's friends was the little Barbie doll. And that was, my, that was the name, that was the identity that I loved. And I never thought that I would give up my prized possession, my hair, my everything. At that moment, if someone had come to me and said, Charlene, I'll make you a deal. If you want your daughter to live, Give me your right arm. I'll make it happen. Me? I would have said, what? One arm is not enough. You're going you're gonna to need both. Without even thinking, I would have given both. But Hashem wasn't calling for my arms. He wasn't calling for my limbs or my organs. Hashem wanted for me to get with the program and to make sure that my outside match up to my inside. I grabbed this shawl and I made my blessing of Shekhyanu and I was wrapping my hair and I was sticking the last strand of hair into my shawl. My husband was in the midst of performing CPR, but he looked over at me and he recognized right away what I had just done. It was very clear to him. So he stopped and he began to pray with kavana, with fervor. I've never seen any person pray with before. And he began to pray and pray and pray. And by the time I finished sticking that last strand of hair into my shawl, my husband gets back to Gali's body. He picks up her body and he puts his fingers on her neck and he begins to scream. I found a pulse, I found a pulse. He must have said it a hundred times. The stretcher was waiting. They loaded Gali onto the stretcher and they sped off towards Mount Sinai Hospital, which is right off of Alton Road and 41st, five minute drive from my building. The rest of my next few hours are really, it's like one big blur. All I know is that somehow my mother shoved my body into the police car that was waiting for me and with police escort, I got to the hospital. We had to have her transferred to a different hospital all the way in Coral Gables because drowning victims require special machines. And we had eight excruciating hours of waiting and testing. But in those eight hours, worldwide Tehillim was launched. Every member of my family was instructed by big rabbis and gedolim from all over the world to take upon themselves mitzvot, specifically in the area of modesty for a woman, 
to dress modestly, to adhere to the laws of proper dress. And I can't tell you countless dollars given to Tzedakah in her merit. And we are waiting for these doctors to come out and to announce what our future holds. We knew she's alive. We knew nothing else. And certainly nothing about her neurological state. We did know though, that she was underwater for three minutes and 10 seconds with no oxygen. So we knew not to have any expectations. The doctors walked into the room. My husband and I jumped to attention and the head doctor takes a step forward. This is six of the top pediatric neurologists and doctors. They walk into the room and they look at me and my husband and they say, Mr. and Mrs. Amanov, we don't know who you are. We don't know what your story, your situation is. But we're having a problem figuring out what happened with your daughter because it just doesn't make sense from a medical perspective. And we've watched the video camera overlooking your pool. We pulled up the footage. We saw that it time stamped. She was underwater. She was clinically dead for three minutes and 10 seconds. And then an additional seven minutes of CPR. It's a heated pool in the middle of Miami, in the middle of the summer. We're working against all odds. We've run her tests 12 times because we can't make sense of why she's alive, let alone no brain damage, no lung damage, no blood gases, no water aspirated in her lung, nothing. We can't make sense of this from a medical perspective. So we're chalking this one up to God. We are calling her a medical miracle. And right then, I thought to myself, this is why Hashem, this is why Hashem came banging on my door. He wanted to give us this miracle, but there's so much more. It just continues. I said to the doctor, I said, Dr. Dr. Meyer, are you Jewish? It was a very bizarre question to be asked upon informing a family that their child survived drowning. So Dr. Meyer answered affirmatively, I think so. I mean, my mom is Jewish. I said, so you're Jewish. Do you believe in God? And he took a step back and he thought to himself, very profound question. I don't know what I believe until now, but I promise you I will go home and I will tell my wife and kids that there must be a God in the world because this two-year-old by the nickname of Gali has been able to prove him to me tonight. And I thought at that moment, I said, if this story were to end right over here, that's enough for me. Because I can live my life claiming that my two-year-old daughter was able to make a grown, brilliant man recognize that Hashem runs the world. But there's so much more. They let us process and, and digest all that they had told us, they told us that she's, thank God, Baruch Hashem, she's fine. She is free to go. However, they wanted to keep her overnight for observation. But in the morning, when the doctor does the rounds, as soon as he checks her out and she's discharged, she will be free to go straight from ICU back to our home. So they all did their farewells and they told us to take our miracle and enjoy. And they left the room. Now, at that moment, I was face to face with my husband for the first time alone since the incident. And I remember thinking to myself, how do you thank the man who saved your daughter's life? How do you thank the man? How do you properly convey your gratitude to the man who not only brought her into this world once, but he brought her into this world twice. And at the same time, I had to inform Jonathan of all the many extreme changes I've made to my lifestyle and his for your information. I threw my husband into the, into the equation for everything that I promised Hashem. So I told my husband, I said, Jonathan, sweetheart, I have to talk to you. I have so many things I have to tell you. He said, no, I have so many things in my heart. I have to tell you. I said, no, 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 let me go first because I want you to forget it faster. He said, oh no, what did you do? So I said, listen, when I saw you doing CPR on her body, I knew that our life is over. So I promised Hashem a bunch of promises. And I just want 
I want you to know that I'm planning on keeping everything. And I hope you're okay with everything because you're kind of involved and I made sure that you promised on your behalf too. So he started nodding like, oh my goodness, what did you say? So I said, well, for one, I can no longer shake hands with your business partners or kiss or hug because I'm now Shomer and Igia. I'm not going to be touching mem members of the opposite sex anymore. I said, number two, I'm no longer wearing bathing suits and open. I'm going to be modest from, from neck to toe. Number three, I'm, the movie theater, I'm so sorry to break it to you, but the movie theater that you're in the process of building in the basement in Great Neck, not plugging into cable. Number four, um, I'm covering my hair. And number five, welcome to your new life. We're doing it Hashem's way. So he thought about everything and he said, okay. He's calculating and calculating. Okay. Bathing suits, clothes, hair. Okay. But movie theater, Super Bowl Sunday. So I said, really? Is that, is that your biggest concern? I said, I'm kidding. Sweetie, I have, an, I have a confession. He's like, yes, I accept all of them. That's a lot. You really took one for the team, but you better be a woman of your word. It's a big theme in our home. You never make a promise you don't keep. You better be a man of your word. You better be a woman of your word. And he said, okay, well, I have a confession of my own. I've never touched a patient so far dead and gotten them back. I know the moment I assess a patient, whether I'm going to get them back or not. There's no question. I touched her. I knew she's gone. She's so far gone. She is not coming back. But I kept saying, Hashem, please don't let me live with the guilt of her death on my shoulders for the rest of my life because I can't handle that. I know I'm not getting her back. I know that this CPR is for show. I know it's not getting, him any, get, getting me anywhere, but I'm gonna do it because I'm my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, my brother-in-law, my wife, my kids, everyone's here looking at me, depending on me, relying on me and counting on me. So please, Hashem, don't fail me. And she said, I was this close to giving up because I knew six, seven minutes of CPR. I knew I wasn't getting her back. But then the moment I saw you stretching your arm for that shawl, I knew you had something in mind. I knew that you had something planned to help me. And the moment you raised up your arm in my heart, I started thinking, yes, yes, Hashem, make her do what I think she's about to do because my hands, my hands are finite and they've maxed out whatever they're able to accomplish. But you, Hashem, you can make my wife take something upon herself that will, that will tip the scales in our favor. Please, Hashem, make her do what I think she's about to do. And of course, right then, I raised up my arm and I belted out this bracha of Shechianu and I'm screaming and sobbing and I'm rapping. My husband said, Amin, to my bracha. And the moment I stuck the strand of, last strand of hair into that shawl, my husband promised Hashem, he said, Hashem, 20 years I've given you Hatzalah. I volunteered through rain, through sleep, through snow. I missed the fat, the, the, the meal before a fast. I went into Yom Kippur with a, a diet sunkist from in the hospital because I took a patient. Hashem, I've given you 20 years of volunteer service for Hatzalah. I've never once asked for anything in return. I'm cashing it all in. I'm cashing it all in. Hashem, if you give me my daughter back, I promise you 20 more years in Hatzalah. So he looks at me in the way that he often does. And he says, sweetie, you're such a drama queen. I just promised Hashem 20 more years in Hatzalah. And I said, okay, that's fine. We accept, we accept it all. Hodul Hashem, thank you, God. We had our tremendous, amazing miracle. And the entire background story of my story is micro miracle that led to this big miracle the man that found her at the bottom of the pool is a man by the name of richard mariansky he's a traveling ceo 
and he lives in the building only a few weeks out of the year. Richard's story was added into my story because it shows how outrageous and kind Hashem is and how Hashem's plans are unbelievably unmatched. Richard was meant to be meeting with clients that day, July 26, 2010. And he was in town, he was in his apartment for a very brief period before he had to run to the conference room to, to meet with investors. Richard got a call by his assistant, by his secretary, telling him that the clients that were flying in missed their connecting flight. And therefore, Richard's meeting got pushed back. It got delayed, it got postponed until they arrived and until they checked in and they were going to meet up later on. So his personal assistant told him, go get your workout in, I'll call you when they arrive. Richard wasn't meant to be in the pool. Richard was meant to be in his boardroom. And even if he, even if he decided to go get his workout in, Richard's preferred method of working out has always been either lifting weights or playing tennis. But listen to this next part of my story. Richard explained in his own words, verbatim. He told myself, face to face with me and my husband, one-on-one, -on -one, he looked at us and he said, the craziest thing, as my, as my secretary calls me, I'm standing by my balcony, having my cup of coffee, ready to go to the meeting. And she says, you know, they missed their flight, go get your workout and I'll call you when they arrive. And I'm thinking, what can I do to occupy my time but be productive? And all of a sudden, my eyes look at this guy and I think to myself, oh my God, what is the sky? Why have I never seen a sky? This, it's cobalt blue. And as he was talking, my heart was racing because I know exactly that guy that he's talking about. It was that same sky Hashem painted with his mercy and his kindness to make sure that Richard chooses to go to the pool instead of the gym or the tennis court. But there's more. Richard finishes swimming laps in the deep end on the east side of our pool. As he begins to climb out of the ladder that's stationed against the wall, he remembers that a few days prior while playing tennis, he pulled a muscle and he was, he was having a little bit of trouble with his left. So he thought to himself, better safe than sorry. Instead of climbing out of the, the ladder and putting a lot of pressure, I'm gonna play safe. I'm gonna walk towards the shallow end of the pool. But again, man plans, but God plans better. Hashem didn't make Richard walk from the east side of the deep end to the east side of the shallow end. Hashem made sure to make that day so glorious, the sky so inviting, the weather so magnificent that Richard wanted to prolong his time in the pool. It was just Richard in the pool that day, or so he thought. So Richard began to swim from the east side of the deep end to the west side of the shallow end. He began to walk slowly across the pool diagonally. And as he's approaching the steps to come out of the shallow end, he sees a little ball rolled up at the bottom of the pool and he picks up the ball and he sees it's my child. Every element of my story is a miracle, but I've got one more. When Gali was born, she was diagnosed with a terrible case of sleep apnea. She had these two monstrous tonsils. She kept getting strep. She snored when she was awake and it felt like Every two weeks, she'd go on antibiotics and then two weeks off. And again, two weeks again, on, on, on. And I was at my wit's end. She was two years old and I was big and pregnant, about to give birth to my fourth. And we were going to be moving down immediately after I had my baby. So I took Gali to my pediatrician and I said, doctor, please, I'm begging you, find a solution for this. We can't keep doing this. She needs, she needs to get off. These antibiotics, she's constantly getting sick from these tonsils. What do we do? So he looked at me and he said, enough is enough. You're getting her tonsils removed. And I said, no, 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 wait. No, we can't do it now. I'm giving birth, We're moving to Miami. I'll be back in September. Please, please, can we push it off? He said, but this child is not growing. She's not, she's not thriving. She needs her tonsils out right away. And I begged him, please, please, just let me do it right after the summer. So finally he agreed. And we're gonna fast forward until the fall, we move back to New York. 
and we have her appointment at St. Francis Hospital where she's having her tonsils and her adenoids removed. And suddenly the OR doors swing open, out walk the anesthesiologist and the ENT. And they come out and they look at me and they say, your child is a total miracle. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I mean, I know, but what, what do you know? What now? And they said, you don't understand. Had you listened to your pediatrician and removed her tonsils before you went to Miami for the summer, she wouldn't be alive. You see, we, we begin to intubate her and her tonsils locked up. And the moment they locked up, they blocked her airway. And when they locked up, they weren't allowing any air or water from going down or coming up. And as this is happening, the nurses in the OR start alerting the doctors to the pulse oximeter. And they're looking at her oxygen levels and her oxygen levels aren't even dropping, which means Hashem in his brilliance knew to give this child horrible tonsils from when she was born so that for two years, she would train herself to require low levels of oxygen. She, would, she was like a mountain hiker. The air up there is so thin, she, she had it under control. Who cares, oxygen? I don't need that. I've got sleep apnea. I can handle being underwater for three minutes and 10 seconds. And it was mind blowing to hear that all these instances, which at the time seemed like severe inconveniences, but at the same time, almost like Hashem was punishing me. Hashem, why me? How many times can my child get sick? She's constantly getting a fever. She's constantly at the doctor's office. She's constantly on medication. She keeps getting strep. Hashem, enough. I can until here. And then all of a sudden, I had this aha moment that, oh my goodness. Hashem was never punishing me. It was, it was a blessing in disguise. And the fact that Richard could have been very irritated that his clients messed up his whole schedule for the day, but those clients missed that connecting flight for me, for my daughter's sake. Hashem had everything figured out. So ladies, gentlemen, my story is one that will prove to anybody in the world that Hashem is kol yachol. Hashem is capable of anything and everything. There is no situation too hopeless or too helpless for Hashem. And there's an amazing saying, Yeshuat Hashem keheref ayin. It means the salvation of Hashem can come in the blink of an eye. Which leads me to Purim. You see, I have a mantra and I want you to all remember, I want you to, Learn this mantra and I want you to apply it to every, every instance in your life. Every time you are faced with a challenge, with a stress, with something that seems insurmountable, think of me and remember Gali's story and remember this one line. Hashem doesn't want you to stress. He just wants you to stretch. That's it. And you may ask, but how? How do you stretch? It's so simple. Hashem tells us in his, he makes it, he simplifies it for us. He says, Open up for me an opening the size of an eye of a needle. And I will return to you. An opening that chariots can ride through. It's a huge return on your investment. All Hashem wants is an eye of a needle. Whatever you can do. If you are not yet keeping Shabbat, try to keep this Shabbat. If you are not yet keeping kosher, give it a go. If you are already wearing modest clothing and you're like, but what's next? Find any area in your life where you can stretch, but don't make it something Hashem doesn't ask you for, give me mountains, give me valleys, give me skyscrapers. No, no, no. He says, give me an eye of a needle. Make it enough that Hashem sees that you are waking up, so to speak, but don't make it painful enough that it's going to hurt you. 
Hashem doesn't want that either. And now with Purim just hours away, this is the holiest day on the Jewish calendar for prayer. Purim is actually number one for the most powerful day to pray. Yom Kippur is a very close runner-up. In fact, if you look at the words, Yom Kippur is also called Yom HaKippurim. HaKippurim in Hebrew means like Purim. The power of Purim is unbelievable. And it is an opportunity for every person here, all 111 holy people who are listening on, for you to tap into something extraordinary. And we have one day where we can go to Hashem and ask for whatever it is in the Megillah that we're going to be reading tomorrow night. The Megillah is all about the miracle of Purim and Esther Hamaka, Queen Esther, goes before the king and the king has, is, has fallen so head over heels in love with this beautiful queen that he says to her, what my love, my beauty, my queen, what do you, what do you, what, what do you want? What do you wish? What is your request? Ask me, ask me for up to half my kingdom. I'll give it to you. We are told that in the entire Megillah Esther, Hashem's name is not mentioned once because it's a time where Hashem was hidden. However, every time in the Megillah, it says Hamelech, the king, without the word Achashverosh after it, it is really referring to Hashem. And that verse is actually Hashem speaking to us, his children. He says to us, Mabakashatech, what do you wish? What is your request? Up to half my kingdom, I'm willing to give you. Just ask me. So we have an amazing opportunity at our feet right now where we can ask Hashem for whatever it is. Everybody here has something in their heart. Everybody here has some stress, some pain, some sadness, some question, something, some question mark. Pour your heart out to Hashem. Don't let the day pass. And all of a sudden, Friday night, we light our candles. And then we remember, oh, I did not get a chance to even pray for one minute today. I did not get a chance to speak to Hashem even for a minute today. Prepare ahead. Plan accordingly. Take this as your wake-up call. Make yourself 10 minutes, half hour, one hour time between Thursday night and Friday evening where you will go into a private room and you will shut the door. And you will talk with your own words to Hashem. He's, he's the king. We are his queen. And he wants to give us up to half the kingdom. We just have to ask. And make that your chudo shalmacha. That can be your eye of a needle. It doesn't have to be anything painful. For me, in my particular story, I had to give up a lot. I mean, it was a lot. From, it was, I would have given up much more. And Hashem knows that. But that's not what Hashem is requiring. Just, a, just an eye of a needle. And I, I want to give you all, I want to close. We'll ask, we'll do some Q&A, but I want to close with a blessing, a bracha to all of you. May you all be blessed to witness the revealed, the revealed nisim, the revealed miracles, and the revealed chasadim, kindnesses that Hashem bestowed upon me. But in your case, you should all be spared from that scary test, that nisayon that came beforehand. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I guess Rabbi Federgren or um, oh, Jonathan sorry. or anybody, Becky, if you want to. Thank you uh, so much. Sorry, I was on mute. Technology. But um, we, thank you so much for sharing your story. Honestly, that you are like, that was such an incredible, inspiring story. I was engaged the entire time. Um, I have so a much. couple questions for you. <laughs> So, can I ask the first one? Can I can yeah. I read everybody's mind? There's 107 people still on. I'm going to read every single one of your minds. And if you're not thinking this, you're lying. What happened to my housekeeper? That's a great question. Yes. Every person wants to know what happened to my housekeeper. So that is that is the number one question I get asked. 
And I'll tell you the truth. I had a very, very hard time, a very hard time making eye contact with her for a while. And I didn't fire her right away because there was too much going on. It was, it was too, too chaotic. And I needed to really, you know, it's not good to act on anger. You know, there's a beautiful book, Igeras Haramban, and it's an awesome book for anybody who wants to read. If you are being challenged by unruly kids and, and you want to learn how to deal and how to cope, read this book. It's going to change your life. But it is, you, you're meant to never react when you're angry. And I was very angry and I was very hurt. And I was very, there was so much going on in my life and I just, I needed answers. So I called my rabbi and I said, can you tell me if there's anywhere in the Torah that allows a Jewish woman to commit murder to a non-Jewish woman? And he said, God forbid, Charlene, no, that's one of the 10 commandments. You cannot kill anybody. You cannot become a murderer. And I said, no, 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 no. See, I find myself wanting to, to climb into her room in the middle of the night and wrap my hands around her neck and watch her die. What's wrong with that? So he said, okay, I get it. Okay, you're frustrated, rightfully so, but you have two options. You can look at your housekeeper as the negligent housekeeper, which caused this nightmare to unfold. And you can fire her. Everybody will say you did the right job. She was sleeping on the job. Good for you. And you can get rid of her out of sight, out of mind, never have to make eye contact with her again. You'll feel much, much better about yourself. That's a guarantee. Or you can look at her as the puppet through which Hashem carried out a miracle for your family. And you can choose to keep her. And if you choose to keep her, could you imagine the Kiddush Hashem you would be making? Could you imagine the glory you would be giving to Hashem? that you chose to keep her because you're passing a very hard test in your belief of Hashem, in your emunah. So which one are you going to do? I said, oh, Rabbi, that's so dirty. Why would you do that? You know, I'm going to pick the second one. And I, and I chose her. I chose to keep her until there's an until. Thankfully, there is an until. I was missing a pair of really cute winter gloves, a cute little pair of Gucci gloves that I would always keep in my coat pocket. And I called her into my room and I said, Christina, have you seen my gloves? And she says, no. I said, are you sure? I'm very, very particular. I'm really organized. They're all, I, I, everything is matches up. I don't misplace things. Are you sure? She said, I'm sure. And I gave her one more chance. And then she said, I did not take them. So I said, okay, T.O., time out. I opened my MacBook and I pressed play. And she watched herself on the hidden cameras, walking over to my coat, taking out my gloves and walking off. And she, you know, her head, her head fell, tail between the legs. And she said, should I pack? I said, yeah, that would be fantastic. So Baruch Hashem, she's no longer with us. She's, rumor has it, she's back in her country. But I felt so good about myself for not having fired her for the golly drowning incident. But stealing is a different ball game. So out she went. One shot was amazing. Two shots, totally understandable. <laughs> totally. totally. For sure. So just some other questions we have from attendees is, how do you rationalize when bad things happen to good people? That is the billion dollar question. And I'm going to tell you very honestly. I'm going to answer that with something that may not make many of you happy because it's not gonna give you such closure, but it's the very truth. And it's the only, the only answer to that question. In this world, we don't have all the answers, but in the world to come, we have zero questions. Everything will make sense in the world to come. This world is called Alma de Shikra. It's a world of lies, it's a world of confusion. We're not meant to know all the answers in this world. In fact, if 2020 taught us anything, it's that we have no idea what's going on. Up until now, we thought we were in control. I think the pandemic taught us that we were never in control to begin with. Hashem just let us think we were in control for a little bit. But that is a question that it's probably the most unsolved mystery of Judaism. But all we know is that we are in this world to gain as many tickets, like if you ever go to Dave and Buster's, I don't know if you have a Dave and Buster's in Vancouver, but 
it's it's an ar arcade and it has a lot of really fun games and you play all these games and every time you win the game it shoots out tickets and i explained this to my kids i said once you play all these arcades you're having so much fun you're going through with all of your friends and having a grand old time and you're accruing credits and then at the back of the dave and buster's arcade is the, the game store it's the game shop it's where you redeem your tickets so you go in with your bucket of tickets and you go through all of the ticket prizes and you say, okay, for a thousand tickets, I can get this, this bongo. For 10,000 tickets, I could get a Nintendo Switch and it goes on and on. So I explained to my children, I said, this world is the playroom of, of Dave and Buster's. You're just getting the tickets over here. In the world to come, that's the game store. That's where you go and that's where you get to redeem all of your tickets. So we can't make sense of Hashem's ways but all we know is that Hashem doesn't make any mistakes. In the world to come, we'll see how everything really was meant to be and how everything was. It wasn't bad, it was seemingly bad. I know it's not the answer you wanted to hear, I'm sorry. I think that's a great answer. And I think, you know, your stories and giving it, the analogies that you do really make a lot of sense to people who are listening. There's, there's not gonna be an answer to everything especially in the world that we live in right now. Exactly. Not now. Um, soon. Not now. Exactly. Soon. Very, so very soon. Question, another question we have is, do you ever have questions or doubts since your daughter was brought back to life? What do you mean by questions or doubts? I think, uh, expand on that. This is a good, Rabbi Pettergrun, I think this is, was your question if you want to. I don't know if we can unmute him. Or maybe not. Oh, he's unmuted. Oh, but we can't hear him. We can't hear you. Okay, maybe we will come back. Does the that. rabbi does the rabbi want to type his, his question in the chat and we can see it from there? Oh, two minutes. Okay, hold on. In belief in Hashem, he says, he adds, questions or oh. doubts in belief of Hashem? Doubt or absolute bulletproof emuna. I feel like once you see Yad Hashem, once you see the hand of God in any instance in your life, you can never unsee it. And when I wake up in the morning and I say, Moda Ani, and I thank Hashem, for giving me my soul back, I say it with the with the fervor and the kavana it's meant to be said with because I know what I could have, I know the life I could have been living right now. And I thank Hashem so deeply and so much for choosing me to be the recipient of his kindness. And I think it's enhanced my love and my belief in Hashem so much. Listen, I'm I'll be honest, you know the saying Hashem tests the ones he loves. He's clearly obsessed with me. Because I've had I've had a crazy journey. Um, the same year that Gali drowned, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. She uh, was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. As a result of my mother's cancer diagnosis, my father, who is a New York City Marathon runner, had a stress-induced heart attack. And then my best friend since birth choked on a bone and died, all in, in 10 months. And it was a year of very dark and challenging times in my life. But I think that if I could turn back time to change anything, I wouldn't. Because now, almost 12 years later, I recognize that so much light has come from my darkness. So how can I change anything? You know, 16,000 women saying Mishnah Kochai, 17,000 women, began to cover their hair for the first time as a result of my daughter's story because we founded the wig company in, in gratitude to God for her life. And we took our story and we just like, like an octopus, like with hands all over the place, we just decided to spread light and spread God's name and glory. And I think that bringing Hashem into every element of your life, even when you feel like you're constantly in a tornado or a typhoon, in my case, recognizing that everything's happening from God and just being positive and grateful throughout it really does soften the blow a lot. And if I can survive 2010, everybody in the world could survive 2020 and 2021. 
And I think that, please God, I really think that Mashiach is coming very soon and everything will make sense very soon. Amazing. Thank you for answering that. So I will, I'll just ask you one last question and then we'll wrap up for the evening to be aware of everyone's time, especially knowing you're on the Eastern time zone. So thank you. Don't um, worry, my, ne my is, next Zoom, my next Zoom starts at 12. Don't worry, my, my night has, my, the night yeah. is young. Oh, wow. Um, so just in terms of your transition to being Froom, like what was your biggest challenge in that transition? Oh my gosh. I, you're going to laugh when I tell you what my hardest, my hardest, the biggest, the hardest challenge. Okay. I'll be honest. The modesty, dressing modestly for me wasn't a challenge because this is a little fun fact about me. Before I became religious, I used to model for Chanel. Um, I, I, I would, I would model their makeup for shows. And fashion was always a huge part of my life. And I love clothing. I love fashion. I love modest fashion. I just, I'm, I'm a glam girl. From the moment I wake up, I actually get dressed from my feet up. I decide which shoes I want to wear. And then I build my, I build my, my outfit upward. And then of course the shaitel is like the finishing touch, the cherry on top. So for me, the hair wasn't a challenge because with wigs, you really never have a bad hair day again. The clothing wasn't a problem because I thank God, I feel like we, could take the fashion in the immodest way and just make it fashionable in a modest way. So that wasn't hard. Not touching other people was not a problem. I'm like, even better, less, you know, less germs, much better for me. But the hardest thing for me, and you're gonna think it's really funny, I love coffee. I'm a coffeeholic and I love chocolate. I love white chocolate. I love, love everything, chocolate and creamy and, and fattening and dairy. The hardest thing for me, was promising Hashem that I'm gonna go from three hours to six hours between milk, meat and milk. That was the hardest. And I can't, like, I, I'll question myself every time I'm about to bite into meat. I'm like, do I really wanna commit for the next six hours of my life to being fleshig? Am I able to do this? Can I go six hours without chocolate or coffee or ice cream? And it's like, that for me is the hardest, which thank God is really no big deal. But that's my that's my my honest truth, and my husband and my kids here can attest. I just I that's the hardest for me. Six hours. We have timers now. Like guys, when mommy finishes her last bite of meat, mark the mark the time. And thank God, it's a good problem. Well, the good thing there's lots of milk alternatives these days as well. Almond milk. Not the same. Not the same. <laughs> And vegan, not the same, it's true. Um, okay, one last question, because I think everyone's also wondering this, is what has happened to your daughter, Gally, since her drowning, um, and how is she doing? Why, why don't here. I show you? Why don't I show you? Yes, it's a great way to wrap up the evening. Wait, she's prepping for her Purim show tomorrow. So she and my other daughter Aww. just gave themselves, wait, no, 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 it's, but it's, it's gonna crack you guys up. She's dressing up as a punk. So they went to CVS and my husband allowed them, don't ask. He allowed them to buy these crazy false nails. So she's going to come on and she's very awkward that her nails are already ready for tomorrow. But <laughs> this is Gali. Yeah. Hi, Gali. So if everybody wants wow. to know the truth, Gali is, Baruch Hashem, a very, very bright and very special and very capable and very spoiled little girl. She is perfect. Thank God there are no remnants. There are no, um, I think the lasting effects are more with her mommy than with her. Mm -hmm. She's fine. She's perfect. Her mommy still gets a little cuckoo around pool, but do you want to say anything? Um, hi. <laughs> oh, I'm on my headphones. So she says, hi. can you hear her? Say something. Do you hear, you, me? Do you hear her? Can you guys hear no. her? Well, yeah, they golly, it's, it's amazing to meet you and I, I feel like your mom is so so proud of you and you're such an inspiration I mean that entire story was incredible thank you so much for sharing I think everyone left with at least I mean I'm going to be thinking about that for the next uh, for a while it really stuck with me that story so I really appreciate you sharing it tonight and it's so nice to finish off with meeting your daughter in in real time so thank you, thank you again Oh. We're going to have Gali give everybody a blessing just because I feel like... Okay, perfect. I think Hashem's on her team, you know? Hashem, she's got Hashem on her side. Go ahead. Hashem to bless everyone who's on the Zoom. 
So only have Parnessa, Hatzlacha, Shalom, Translate the words, translate the words. Only success. success, happiness, goodness, wealth, health. You should never be sick, have no worries, no sadness, no anxiety. You should always be able to choose the right from the wrong. You should always have Hashem with you. You should mm -hmm. never feel like you're alone. And you should always mm -hmm. be able to inspire people to grow. And like my mother always says, um, not to stress, but to stress. And we should all be zechas to be dancing together by the third base on the this very soon. Amen. Is she a pro Amen. or what? That was incredible. Was that off the cuff? That was like amazing. <laughs> totally. They're still waiting here. I got my whole crew sitting around waiting because every time I give a Zoom, thank God there's a line. There's a line waiting for mommy. You know, I have to sign someone's report. I got to feed someone. Got to feed someone. I got to check out their nails for tomorrow. It's Baruch Hashem. So we're so happy that we were able to bring her on and she can give a bracha because wow. I think this, this girl's bracha will go far in life. So that's good. For sure. Well, thank you so much and say shalom to your whole family. And with that, we're going to close the evening, but we really, really appreciate your time tonight and what an incredible story. So thank, thank you, you so again. Much. And if you don't thank follow you. Charlene already, you should give her a follow because <laughs> you really share some amazing and other inspirational things in your life, like on a daily basis. So I think it's a, it's a great dose of inspiration on Instagram. Thank you so much. Thank you. I was, as I was saying before, Thanks. when we had our, our quick little meeting, I said, it's about time we, you know, let's, let's make Hashem proud, but just be good, spread good. And please God, we should see everybody together again in Jerusalem. hundred percent. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me.